Miss Diane, I guess you'd say that our theology changes as we get a little older. Well, we start sifting through and realize some of the things that we believed in the beginning wasn't as sound as what we begin to learn. And we start to catch and hold of different things. So uh, when, I, when I say theology, what I mean is, is um, a certain interpretations of certain things. Yeah, I've started shifting some, so we'll mention that as we walk along here. We, again, we started in 03 as a church, and uh, those watching on HolyWild.tv, thanks for tuning in. We're glad that you were able to watch. Some of you I know couldn't be here even today, and you wanted to tune in and watch, so thank you. One of the things I realized in 03, I started pastoring in 1993. Before that, for three years, I was a youth pastor. Uh, I was an evangelist from 90 to 93. Let me back up. From 86 to 90, I was a youth pastor. From 86 to 82, I was in Bible college. From 82 to uh, 1979, I was trying to figure out what Christianity meant. Because I got born again November the 10th, 1979. So if I fast forward all this, you'll realize that there is a little gap. When my wife said to you, we've been married 15 years and we have five kids, you know that, and they're all grown. <laughs> right? Then you realize that I've, I've also gone through a, a traumatic time in my life. So in 03, 02, actually, I went through a divorce after pastoring the Crosby Church. And those of you that were there with me know this. That church went from seven people to almost 1,500 people in nine years. It exploded. It was, uh, and be honest with you, and I, I speak this honestly, uh, I wasn't ready for it. I was in my early 40s. So I wasn't ready for the, the growth. I was on TBN, Daystar. I was traveling around the world. Uh, I was a golden child, I guess you'd say. I got my hands laid on me by a man named uh, John Osteen in an elevator asking God to do it again. All this scared me uh, more so than what I could tell you. I had a deep depression come over me. I understand it is very real. Um, and just trying to get, you know, I remember a couple years ago, j told me quit apologizing because I, I go back and I look at it and I realize that as a, as a shepherd, as a pastor, a leader, the hurt that I caused people when I went through the divorce was was uh, disastrous, and I had no idea that I, it was going to happen. I thought me walking away was the best thing in the world, and it wasn't. It hurt a lot of people, but God's able to take a mess and make it into a message, and he did that in my life, so I ended up out at, uh, in New Caney after four, five months in a boy's home in San Antonio. I ended up in New Caney, and uh, when I walked away, I walked away. I, I didn't want any more to do. I wanted them to be able to take on and grow, and uh, it happened. Uh, Pastor Keenan has a church. He's a, a friend of mine from many years ago. So I'm glad that the Crosby Church is growing on. But now, let's talk about the little country church. I ended up out in New Caney, out at that, uh, it was a run-down camp. It was rough, but they asked me to come and run it. So I got out there, and then people started showing up and saying, we want our pastor back. Well, I love you, but I didn't want you back. Uh, and I, I don't mean that mean. I just didn't want to do this again. You know, it was, it's, 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 uh, unless you're called to do it, it's very painful at times. So, because you, you lose, uh, you have friends that go on, you have hurts you got to deal with. And then you also realize your own humanity that uh, I'm just a man. And I've, I've had failures and I've had struggles and uh, I've, uh, I still fight things in my own nature. Uh, I, I think all of us have, deal with the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And, you know, the pride of life was huge. When you're in your early 40s, you got a church of 1,500 people, and you're bringing in a couple million dollars a, month, a year in a little town called Crosby. Uh, you know, you get prideful about it. And the Scripture says pride comes before the fall. And uh, even though I might have known the word, it was still affected me. And um, the pride came, the, fight, the fall was great. And then when I got out in New Caney, I was a very humble man. I was a very broken man. So I, I didn't know if I wanted to do it again. I wanted to be whole. I wanted my life to be right. So we started up again in New Caney. And uh, 30 people, Dick played just like he did, acoustic guitar on the platform. I, I, I sat there and just re and read my Bible to people. That's all I did. I, I wouldn't even, didn't want to go any further than that. The next thing, people said, well, what do we do with the money? What money? Well, you taught us to tithe, and we brought our tithe. And I went, I, I quit. And then they started gathering up money. Next thing you know, we had 30 people, 70 people, a couple of hundred people. We went from the old chapel into the new sanctuary. We re remodeled it. We went from there to over here in a school, school to a funeral home for two years, two years. Came over here, bought this, paid this off, paid that camp off out there. 16 years later, here we are. Amen. And grown in God and still doing the right thing, I believe. Amen. And seeing people reach. And so I've often said, had it not been what I've gone through, most of y'all would not know. 
I wouldn't have known those in New Caney. A lot of you I wouldn't know here. So, uh, like, I look over at Charlie. Charlie and I have been in each other's life a long time, ain't we, Charlie? 95. I did Charlie's wife's funeral years ago, and I scared of Charlie. And I didn't know. He was scared of me, too. He thought I was a biker. So we just kept it at that. So many of you, we go, we go way back. So yeah, if you have your Bibles, I will be moving very quickly. Let's talk about purpose real quick, Mike. Five purposes of our lives. This is, again, it's not on your overhead. Just flip it back in the notes and you can write it. First is worship. Mike, are you there? Stay with me, man. Okay. Worship. We, there, there, there are several things we were planned for. We were planned to, for, for worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and evangelism. And I'll walk you through this. First, worship. We were planned for God's pleasure. That's how, why God made you. When he created you, believe it or not, you are pleasure to him. He's glad you are here. He loves you way too much. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments for this is the duty of all mankind. Fellowship. We were created for fellowship. Let me back, back up one. Back up. I see people taking notes. Just write down worship and I'll make sure I get you an opportunity for you to get hold of this a little bit later. For first, worship. Second, for fellowship. God wanted fellowship. We were formed for a family, James 1.18. Just write the scripture number down there. And we'll get it and look it up later. James 1.18. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. And we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. Woo! Everybody say prized possession. That's what you are, man. That's what you are. So fellowship, we were formed for a family. Deity's dream, God had a dream in the very beginning. And that was for a family. That's why God don't have grandkids. He just got kids. That's all he has. He gave us the joy of the grandkids, but he does got children. Amen. And so it's important. We are the children of God. Discipleship. He made us our purposes for disciple. We were created to become more like Christ. In other words, you're made to grow. You were made to keep growing. You weren't made just to get saved and stop. You were made to keep moving on. So you heard me use the phrase from believers to disciples to Christian. We're moving in this stage. Romans 8, 29. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his own son. So what you see in Christ, in God, don't go too fast on me now. Okay, Mike? Because they're writing stuff down. All right, the same lines as the life of his son. So everything Jesus went through in life to make him a mature son, a lot of things we go through also. But God wants us to grow in him to keep becoming like him and learning. Fourth is ministry. We were shaped for serving God. Romans, uh, excuse me, Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's work, hand, hand, handiwork, one place said workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I wonder what God has prepared for you that you ain't found yet. In other words, this scripture tells me there's something waiting on you tomorrow and the next day. That God has planned something for you. He has figured something out here, and he's prepared in advance for you to do it. So we were shaped for serving God. Everything about us is, has to do with serving and loving him. Ministry is important. Everybody say, I'm a minister. <laughs> say it again. We get so nervous about that. We think, you know, only the preacher's the minister. That's not true. We're all ministers. Amen. God made us to minister to one another, to reach out and connect with another. And then evangelism is going after winning people to Christ. We were made for a mission. Matthew 28, 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So the last words of Christ for us on earth is to go and make disciples, to move from being a believer into the place of discipleship. How do we do that? Well, first, you've got to be saved. Everybody say saved. Saved. When we talk about stable in the saddle, the word stable, what's it mean? As a noun, it's a building where animals such as horses or cattle are fed or kept. Jesus, of course, was born in a manger in a stable. The adjective, though, not likely to fall or give way. You know, this building is very stable where we're at right now. And we'll, we'll be here probably in the next 50, 100 years from now. Uh, so in our own lives, we need to understand to be stable. I've, I've ridden horses not real good. I've been hospitalized by getting thrown off a horse. I've been busted up some. But I say I stayed in the saddle more than I did on the ground. And there was a time, particularly in the beginning of the little country church, a lot of us were on horseback, you know. And, but I can tell you this. If your feet come out of the stirrup, your butt's coming out of the saddle. All right? The stirrups are very important. And when it comes to 
being stable in the saddle is simply that, getting your feet firmly in the word and worship, amen, and keeping your, your seat down in the saddle, learning how to stay stab- stable. And that's what literally sits means. So when I say that, it's for us to be stable. Here, here's what Peter said on how to maintain self-control. Second Peter 1, 5 says, For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, Godliness, brotherly and sisterly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measures, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. You'll notice that this scripture what, that I'm reading to you out of 1 Peter 1 5, that's not on the overhead mic. 1 Peter 1 5 has to do with uh, what Bishop uh, McIntosh was teaching us this week. So we can main all these actions because we are saved. I, I, I like, it says to actually remember these things. Is, is Second Peter at all on, on the overhead? Well, shoot fire. I got to go back over that. Let me read to you Second Peter 1.12. 2 Peter 1.12. I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. So I want to remind you of this. I think that it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made it clear to me and I will make every effort to see that after my departure you will always be able to remember these things. Second Peter 1.12. Make a note, Mike, that I put that in the next table on the saddle because that is such a powerful scripture. Second Peter again, 1 verse 12. Remember these things. One day, as Paul said, I'm going uh, I'm, I'm to be gone. Actually, it's Peter saying I'm going to be gone. I'm going to lay this tent down. And when I do, when it's over with, I want you to realize that what I've taught you is good. Remember this. So he's repeating himself for us to remember it and to remember it and just be established. We can maintain all these actions because we are saved. Ephesians 2.8 should be of that in your, in your booklet. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Who of you thought at one time that you were saved any other way than faith? That in other words, let's, let me do, I'll throw two things at you. First off, you're just a good person. That good people are going to heaven. How many believe that? You don't have to raise your hand. But, but you know that you've heard this before. You know, well, they were good people. Now, how many know that hell is going to be full of a lot of good people? Second, if we thought we would do works, we would work our way into this thing. We would work and be, you know, just, again, it's part of that good person thing, but we did more work. So we joined uh, good boy, good girl clubs, and because of that, we, we, so the Scripture lays out this thing here. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It was even Jesus that said, prostitutes and tax collectors are going to make it to heaven quicker than the Pharisees who love the law. That's an amazing thing, because it's grace. Everybody say grace. It's grace that saves us. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. But God did it anyway. So we accepted his grace. And because of grace, that's why we do, do good works. I don't, you know, you might have done it before, but I, after I realized how much God saved us. And let me mention this. The more you know how bad you were before you got saved usually indicates how great you're going to serve God afterward. Because a lot of us, we get in a place in our life, we go, why, why do they love God? Because of this one thought, that those that have been forgiven much, loves much. Amen. And when you've been forgiven for a lot of things, man, you, you just, and you say, well, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I wasn't a drunkard. I wasn't a drug addict. Think about the other things you were then. Self-righteous, arrogant, uh, self-promoter, all these things. You know, when Jesus looked at a paralytic lowered down through a roof and said, son, your sins be forgiven thee. I've often asked myself, what did a man do who was a paralytic lowered into a roof that can't walk, can't talk, and Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. What did he do? I'll tell you what he did. He envied the fact you could talk and you could walk. He was jealous of your life. You know, sin comes in all kinds of packages and binds us in all different ways. So to realize how much you've been forgiven is a powerful thing in your life. First, it's full. Everybody say full. full. Psalm 103, verse 3. Who forgives all thy iniquities and heals all your diseases? So it's full. Everything, God takes care of it. Forgiveness, past, present, and future. It's factual. Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As east is from the west. In other words, it keeps on going. It's factual. He has forgotten this. It's forever. And I will remember their sins no more. God will choose us to do something you can't do. I said he chooses to. He can actually remember if he wanted to. He don't want to. He actually forgets your sins. So every time you bring them back up, he goes, what? 
What are you talking about? I thought we already dealt with this once. I thought I've already told you once that I forgave you. Why do you keep bringing this back up? Well, because I want to be in self-pity. <laughs> Hello? Because I want to beat myself up. Uh, you know, so you've got to let that go and move on past all of that. You know, I, I wish there was times I couldn't remember certain things. The word repent is a powerful word. Repentance is... Let's just get back to the, what we'd call the penthouse. The Greek is metanoia, the change of mind, the act of giving up the old life in order to follow Christ. The results of repentance, God offers us a trade. We can exchange our selfish, limited, and shallow life for a loving, giving, eternal life. We put off certain things, and we put on new things. Now, I just put a list up here, and you, you, it's not necessarily, sometimes I look at this list, and I kind of laugh about it again. But let's talk about the penthouse real quick. You ever been to a penthouse? The top floor, the overlook. Somebody invited me a couple of years ago to a Rockets game. And they said, hey, we're going to, hey, but you're going to stay in the suites. I said, what? Yeah. Do we bring your son. I forgot who was it that gave me this gift. But they said, bring your son and, bring, and br- let him bring some friends. So um, Judah was probably in the eighth or ninth grade then. So he brought some of his buddies with him. And we got there and they put us up in this penthouse type in the Rockets game. And I'm overlooking the game. I got TVs to watch it. They got food, a buffet behind me. The cheerleaders came in to greet the guys. It was, it was like, whoa, this is, this is incredible. Boy, the boys have never forgotten this memory, man. I mean, they remember watching the Rockets play, and it was one, one of them great games with Harden had. So here, here it is. The repentance literally means re to do again, pent back to the penthouse. When you repent, you go back up to where you once were. So repentance is not a down thing, it's an up thing. When I repent, I get back to the high place that God meant for me to have. So repentance is a good thing. Everybody say a good thing. Amen. Amen. Go to the next slide there, Mike. Amen. Uh, the means of repentance, God speaks to us through his word, his inner voice of the Holy Spirit, as into the areas of our lives that need change. And God's word is a mirror that helps us see our needs. Says, you ever been in church and you, and you said, that preacher preaching right to me. <laughs> How did he know that? Now, look, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about any time I'm in church and somebody else is preaching, I go through the same thing. They talking right to me. It's the, it's the, it's the book. The book is the book is the book. And when you read it, it's like re- looking into a mirror. It re- it's a reflection. It begins to work on your life. Conviction is not a bad thing. Conviction says, okay, I need to straighten this up. I need to deal with that. And so you come in, you may have anger issues or, 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 or envy or lust or jealousies or any of those. And you start looking at a book, and you go, okay, self-control, such a dirty word, amen. And, and you start looking into it, and, and then you realize, okay, I got to change here. So that's conviction. Amen. So when you get that convicting power over you, you, you got to start. You say, all right, Lord, I received that in Jesus' name. Amen. So we put off and we put on. I, I think all of us w- would admit that drugs, alcohol, uh, nicotine can be too. But, but there are certain things in life that we can put off. When I, when I mention drugs, we're, we're, in a, we're in a weird weird time right now in America. Uh, I, I listened to uh, some reports, NFL, f- I, I like football, college, whatever. And so we're going through this time right now where the, the debate, and I, I'm not going to have time to debate it with you, where, whether marijuana is a, is a bad drug. But I've often struggled because I had a problem drinking when I was young. Oh, I drank. Now, I smoked a little too, but, but I, I, I really drank a lot. And drinking changed me, and it made me mean, and it made me vulgar, and it made me, uh, I wasn't a nice guy when I drank. So quitting drinking was important to me. Now, I've said this for years. I I cannot condemn drinking biblically, but I cannot condone drunkenness. Because when you get drunk, you get stupid. Now, I know some of you like a little sip of wine, like I like NyQuil. All right? Let's just tell the truth, shame the devil here. Some people, they'll condemn you for drinking wine, but they're going to they drink a half a bottle of NyQuil before they go to sleep. It's got the same amount of alcohol in it as the wine did, okay? Because we said, well, it's legal, so I can do that. We got this thing where you're going to have to quit looking at what the government says is legal or not legal and say to yourself, God, what is it I can and can't do? Amen. Amen. So for me, if my kids saw me pop a beer or something, I think it would break their heart. Even though they may be able to do it as they get older, it's something that dad don't need to do because of where it's led me. I think you have to take a good look at your life and, say, and be honest and say, okay, this is, this is harmful and this is not. And then if, if somebody around you, the Scripture teaches us, limit your liberty by your love. 
If I, if I love Jason, and I know Jason's got a problem with, with something, I'm not going to do that thing around him. You follow me? I'm going to limit my liberty by my love. I love this man, so I'm not, I don't want to be a stumbling block and make him stumble. So I want to be careful with that. If, if I, uh, and I'm, I'm serious about this. There's certain, I, I got my guys. I can say certain things around David and Joseph that I would not say around some of you. Because some of you would take it and go, well, that was offensive for the pastor to say. But I've been with these guys. We work together. And I'm not talking about being vulgar. I'm just saying I'll be a little more straight up with them than I do with certain other people. Some folk can't take you being human. They just can't take it. They want to set you up here and put a collar on you, you know, and make you all priestly like. And I, I just can't, I, I can't go there. I don't, I don't want to go there. So there's certain things we put off in life, you know, immorality, friends that draw you back into the world. We put on good habits, good deeds, fellowship, witnessing, pure, clean, selfish love for people, friends that make you get closer to God. So that, that's what happens when you get saved. Go to the next one. And I found out this, negative, unclean ways of talking. How many know your tongue got you in a lot of trouble? If you can learn to use it, if death in life is in the power of the tongue. If I can learn to use my tongue properly and be a little more positive and uplifting and thankful. And I mean the same thing with your fingers. When you're typing on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you, you use your fingers because it's, it, them fingers are a reflection of your mouth of what you're saying. Be careful what you say. I chewed somebody's butt out a couple of days ago for what they put on Facebook. Don't be an idiot by putting your uh, laundry on Facebook. Don't do it. Don't do it. And don't put somebody else's laundry on there. Amen. And quit jumping on the bandwagon. I told him, I said, I wanted to rebuke you, but had I said anything on Facebook, 2,000 of my peeps would have saw it. And the last thing I wanted is for them to see what I was mad at you about. All right. All right, positive, uplifting. Uh, go back. Uh, unclean, of course. Clean thoughts, anger, bitterness toward God, self, and people, love, and forgiveness. Why is it important? We'll talk a little bit more about this later. Get rid of uh, anger and bitterness. Anger that's not dealt with properly comes to bitterness. A man came to me this week. I, like I mentioned to you, I did his daddy's funeral, but he was angry. He's angry at, his, at how it happened, what happened, and we dealt with it. He said, I, I'm upset. And I said, anger comes from God. God gave you the emotion of anger. But you cannot allow anger to have too much room in your life. Matter of fact, Scripture says don't let your uh, anger, uh, sun, go down on your wrath. In other words, give it a time limit. I'm going to be mad for so long, and then I'm going to get over this. I'm, gonna, I'm not, I'm not going to sleep on it. I'm going to take care of this. Anger, because anger not dealt with properly turns to, to bitterness, bitterness to hatred, hatred to murder. So you have to take care of that. Well, these are things that change. This is the biggest thing that changed in my life when I got born again. My heart toward people. My love toward people, it meant I, the, the anger, the bitterness, the hatred began to leave me, and I found myself in love with people. Secrets of abundance, I love this. You've got to use your talents. Everybody has a talent. Well, the, in, when you read the New Testament, the, the word talent was actually like a monetary thing, a talent of money. Everybody here has a talent in your life. I believe some have multiple talents. So when you get involved in the things of, of God in this house, involvement equals stickability. <clears throat> For those of you here in the South Campus, let me mention to you here in Crosby, the camp in New Caney is yours. I think we have this little divide going on. You think, that, okay, uh, then there's New Caney, and New Caney has a camp, and we're Crosby, and New Crosby has a Walmart. <laughs> okay, this, this is not, they, they both are ours. The reason I say that is there are those of you who have retired or, or have extra time. That camp was made for you. It was made to give you a, a purpose, a place. When Sister Roy mentioned OCD, so important, uh, uh, the, 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 these old guys that come out. And, and the truth of the matter is a lot of them have been there with me until they passed on. They, but they found fulfillment in being out there. Uh, some of you remember Bear, one-eyed Bear. You know, he, Bear came to camp, uh, was out there for a while, and then he passed on. Jimmy Roberts, and then my mind goes through uh, uh, Don. Don would come out to the ranch, Don Witten. And, uh, you know, so I, these people would, would be a part of our lives. So it's important for you to realize that place is yours also. And it may be a little bit of a drive, but it's worth it. It meant to come out there. So involvement equals st stickability. When you stick to something, it equals stability. If I can stay with it long enough, I become stable. Why is stability important? Because it brings forth productivity. Let me tell you something. Your fulfillment in life it has everything to do with your production. The more you produce, the more you fulfill. When you work a job and you work it hard and you get that paycheck, don't it make you feel better? 
Amen. You get that big paycheck, you know, thing. same way in life. If, you, if you're producing, uh, we took a time a week ago and went to Florida just to produce. And I believe we were effective in the days that we were there. We made things happen. We, we made things better. I was uh, conversing with a pastor in Florida yesterday about uh, what went on there and how, how, you know, how blessed he was that we came there. It made us feel fulfilled. Let's be honest about it. It felt good to go help somebody else. It felt good to produce for somebody else. So uh, I, I want you to look at this and realize in your own life, if you don't stick to something, the reason you're here right now is so that you will stick. Amen? And you'll stay with it. Everybody good with all that? Amen. What we got next, bro? Baptisms? Uh, in, your, in your notes there, I think you might have quarterback rules. Yeah, you see that in your notes? Is that in your, in your notebook? I thought I saw it. Flip over to you. Is it not there? Okay. If it's not there, we'll, tell me if you see it anywhere in that notebook somewhere. Let me just mention to you about quarterback rules. I'm just going to throw this at you. In football, of course, you know I love me some football. Then this is how this church operates. You, when you look at life, you've got to look at the personnel in the huddle. I do this all the time. I come to church. Who we got in the band? Who we got in the booth? Who we got in the children's church? Where's our personnel? Okay. When I see my personnel, then I know what kind of day we're going to have. All right, and if everything's locked and loaded, then we're in good shape. The next thing I look for, you have to do your best and help people find their gift and in their, in where, their, uh, where, their, where their gift is is so important, not their comfort zone. Sometimes we grab, well, not some, all the time we gravitate toward our comfort zone. But you'll find out God's always trying to pull you out of the boat. He's always trying to get you to walk on the water. He's always trying to get you to go a little bit further than you've ever been before. So, uh, is that, it's not in the book, is it? No, I need to get, that's another thing we need to add. Tell, Carol, y'all make sure we add that, all right? Quarterback rules. We want to make sure we add that. So in position on the field. I'm just going to mention one more thing about quarterback rules. Audibles. You know what an audible is? An audible is when you come up under the center, the quarterback does, and he's got a play he's going to run, so he's going to hand the ball off to a halfback, but instead he realizes that somebody's not covering his receiver, and he calls an audible. And he'll, you know, uh, uh, what was his name? Peyton Manning was good at it. What was the word he used? Omaha. 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 He'd say that, you know, and he, what he was doing was calling audible. In other words, at, at the very last moment, he shifted to play. Sometimes in this church, audibles get called. And when they get called, it means just flex with it. Just go with it. We, you know, we may not have this going or that going, so we're going to call an audible real quick. Or we may have somebody come in. Man, I'm going to tell you something. If I'm in this church and I look back in the back and I saw David Huff sitting in the back, I'm calling an audible. Amen. Amen. I'm bringing him to the platform throwing a guitar around that man. That's what I mean by audible. It's very important. So we've walked through salvation. We've walked through repentance. We've dealt with that part of it. Let's get into baptisms. Holy Ghost and water baptism. Amen. I've got to find where my notes start. Let's go here. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. When you got born again, God was drawing you. You may not recognize or realize it, but he was drawing you. He put you in the right place at the right time to pull you forward. It was on a Saturday night I got drawn in on November the 10th that God began to draw me. I felt his presence pulling me. Amen. For by one spirit we are baptized into one body. Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. Now, when I talk about this, we're going to get on to it. I don't want you scared. I found a lot of people nervous about this subject. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. According to Acts chapter 10, verse 43 through 48, man baptizes us into water. It's a, belie- it's a commandment for every believer. Let's talk about water first. Matthew 28, 18, the Great Commission, go make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them. Acts 2, 38, on the day of Pentecost, Peter commanded people to be baptized. It wasn't an option. Let me deal with some heresy here. Acts 2.38 says, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Now, the problem I have with this is the United Pentecostal Church, some apostolic churches have taken it and made it into their dogma, which means that if you are not baptized, you do not come out of the water speaking in tongues, you are not saved. (coughs) Do you know the pressure that puts on you? To think that if I don't come out of this water tongue talking, I'm going to hell? And that the water didn't work? And they will rebaptize you until they can get you to come up and talk in tongues or stay on you. I've been involved in Pentecostal churches most, man, or drown you. Yeah. I've been involved, like Sister Diane, in Pentecostal churches a long time. And, uh, but there's, there's a lot of truth in Pentecostal churches. On the day of Pentecost, 
when, when they were in the upper room, the Spirit of God blew into the place and it, it shifted the lives of people forever. There was a change. The problem is I think we have made it scary. Let, let me not get too far ahead of myself here. Let's uh, find out where I'm at. The example of baptisms, this is my son in whom I am well pleased in Matthew. Uh, when Jesus was baptized, and I watched this again last night uh, on, the, on the Bible, John was baptized, and Jesus came and told John to baptize him. And, and John had just said, there's coming one after me that, whose shoelaces I'm not worthy to touch. And he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then when he came, he, was, he looked at John, and uh, G, John says to Jesus, I, I, you know, I have need to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, no, let's fulfill the law. Now, Jesus was not baptized to be saved. His baptism was recognition. It wasn't repentance. It was recognition. So when he was baptized and brought back up, the Scripture says there was a sound that came over him. John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? And Jesus said, let it be so now. It's proper for us to fulfill the righteousness. And John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And the voice from heaven said, this is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Again, the blindness of the Jewish people, not to pick up the fact that Messiah had come, that he was baptized, a voice comes out of heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. It was affirmation, validation that God's son was on earth to do the mission of heaven. There's something about it, and yet people still didn't quite see it. All the miracles, all the things that Jesus did, but the baptism was important. It was confirming that this was the son of God. My goodness, guys, if you'd have heard a voice come out of heaven, when you got baptized, you know, you, yeah, huh? Jesus come up out of that water wet, heard his father say, you know, and, and before this, we know that he's been praying. He's been praying. But we don't hear audible voices during that time. This is something that came out of heaven. This was God speaking. When, I, when I'm reading this, I get excited about it because I realize God is watching us. He's observing us. He, he speaks over us. He's talking to us. Amen. So uh, when, when Jesus was baptized, it was an amazing thing that, that took place in his life. Amen. Let's keep on rolling here. The power of baptism. We buried the old man. In other words, we're able to look back on that day and say, listen, the old is gone. The new has come. Devil, I, I don't have to listen anymore to you. And it's, it's a wet grave to rise and walk in newness of life. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live in a new life. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. So baptism is important. It's something that I think that, that all of us should step into. If you've not been baptized, we have a baptistry here. Please sign up to be baptized. Uh, the Scripture teaches that, that there, there's, there's some power in it. There's something about it. For we know our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now let's talk about Let's ask questions first here on baptism, water baptism, very quickly if you have any questions. Anyone? Come on. Surely you've got a question about water baptism. Right behind me, right behind we have a horse trough. It's actually a horse trough back there behind me. And all you got to do is sign up, and we will actually have, we have heated water here. That's right. That's right. It's a little bit better here. Uh, let me say it's a little bit warmer here. I don't know if it's any better, but it sure is warmer here. Amen. Also, by the way, guys, uh, if you've ever been around me when I'm baptizing, I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and as the disciples carried forth commandment in the name of the Lord Jesus. The reason I do that, again, is, is because of all the conflict that we've got over baptism formulas. There, I was brought into a church that believed in Jesus' name only baptism. So you were baptized in Jesus' name only. As if somehow if you said Father, Son, Holy Ghost, it didn't count. Uh, and they may, this is a dogma. This is a hard teaching that Jesus only, that it, only you're going to get baptized. So also on the Trinitarian side is Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And they're dogmatic about that. So what do I do? I say them both. Because I believe that they can't be wrong if I say both. I have a, I have a friend 
uh, who baptizes in tongues. He don't say any of it. He just starts speaking in tongues and baptizes and says the Holy Ghost can't be wrong. I don't know. I, I, I just soon say it. So I'm going I'm to pray over you, say that over you, and believe that the old is gone and the new has come. Amen. And there's, there's power in that. Any questions about baptism? Charlie? I was baptized in Uh huh. Were you sprinkled or baptized? Sprinkled. Yeah. And how is that? I, I, I use the issue conscience. If your conscience tells you that you should be rebaptized, then be rebaptized. I would do it as my conscience. Okay, because I know a lot, some were baptized as children. We baptize a lot of, now we don't baptize babies. But we baptize six, seven, eight-year-olds who realize that their lives uh, have, have been converted. They, they've repented. They've done wrong. They realize they've done wrong, and they want to they serve God. So we have baptized children. Uh, uh, what I mean, uh, younger, older children. Um, so I would say if you've not been baptized, you know, or if you've been baptized when you're younger and you live like, up to a certain point and you said you know what I think I, I'm going to start this thing over again I don't see anything wrong with that amen yes ma'am uh-huh good that's fine yeah rock on and, and here's another thing I've done you should, we mentioned sprinkling uh, with Methodists I have used a bottle of water on people that can't get in the tub people can't get in the in the pool you know, because they, they're older, uh, they found Christ at the end of their life, but they're physically unable to get in. I've taken a bottle of water and believe by faith that that's good. Amen. Amen. In other words, I'm not going to get overly religious on this point. Because I believe that we're saved by faith through grace. Amen. It was the grace of God that saves us. The baptism shows that we believe in Him and we're obedient to Him. Amen. Holy Spirit baptism. Holy Spirit is the word parakletos. Uh, anybody ever been to court? Anybody ever had to stand before a judge? Did you have a lawyer? Did you have an advocate? Did you have, you know, I have three adopted children. All three of my kids had to have advocates when I went to court. They had to have somebody that represented them and, and their rights. So, he, and so I had to pay for it, of course, but they had to have an advocate. Uh, that's what the Holy Spirit is in your life. He's an advocate. He's a he. Come on. In this gender-friendly day, when you're almost scared to say something like that, the Bible calls him a he. He calls God a he, too. And that, that, that should, for women, that ought to secure you. Yeah, it ought to make you feel good. You got daddy with his arms around you. Amen. I, I, so I don't know why we, we keep beating this thing, but, it, but it's where we're at. The Holy Spirit paracletes is called to one side, aid, counsel for the defense, pleads another's case, intercessor. That's the Holy Spirit. Keep rolling here. The promise of the Spirit, Joel chapter 2, verse 28, and afterward I'll pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will, will prophesy. Old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my Spirit in those days. So it's talking about a day to come. Joel was prophesying a day to come. Acts chapter 2, Peter declared, this is that which Joel spoke about. And I'm going to tell you what that is. The sons and the daughters are prophesying. Old men are seeing dreams. Young men are having visions. This is that. So he, this is that has already taken place in the day of Pentecost. John 7, 38 says, streams of living water will flow from within you. By this, he meant the spirit with whom, uh, with those who believed in him were later to receive up to that time, the spirit had not been given. So when I, when I read this and I realize that, that there's a promise of the Holy Spirit, the believers are to receive the Holy Spirit in John chapter 7, verse 38. The results of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you shall receive power. Everybody say power power and, and be my witnesses after that the holy spirit has come upon you now here's here's the, always the question that people have whether you're baptist presbyterian methodist pentecostal how, how does this happen first off i would encourage you to ask god to send the holy spirit into your life and don't be afraid um it's i've been a tongue talker for 30 something years now but we don't, you don't see us actively doing it in the church. The reason why is because Corinthians tells us that, there, that, it is, uh, that it's better to speak a thousand words in a known tongue, uh, one word in a known tongue than a thousand words in an unknown tongue. And some people elevate this spirit uh, gift that they've got to a place that makes them feel like they're super saints. 
And it, it's caused arrogance in the church. So what's important is, for, first off, for you to ask God to fill you with the Spirit. Then ask God to, to give you a tongue. To begin to speak in other tongues. And, and you may start out like a, like a baby. I mean, I don't mean it's demeaning. Goo, goo, ga, ga, whatever, dad, dad, mama. It, it'll start off something, maybe even like that. Or it may gush out of you. It may flow out of you, which happened in my life. And then there's always that question, is this for real? The, the, the evidence is going to be found in two ways, power and love. You're going to have boldness like you never had. You're going to realize that God is for you, and you'll start loving people. The problem I've had with religion is just because you've got a gift of tongues doesn't mean for you to be mean to everybody. And I've seen that happen. So, therefore, I'm, I'm very careful on this subject. But I would encourage you, don't be afraid to ask God. And don't get scared if it happens in this church. Don't, don't take off and bug out on me. All right? Because, I mean, it can happen at any time. God could move on somebody and they begin to speak in other tongues. All were baptized. What did they? They spoke in a tongue. They had another tongue. The word is glossolalia. In other words, they spoke the language of the people that were around them. So some were speaking in Spanish, some were speaking in Aramaic, some were speaking in Greek. And, they were, and people said, I understand them in my own tongue. I think a really, man, when you know somebody's really got it, is when they start speaking to somebody in their tongue. And they don't even know what they're saying, but God's talking to them. Don't you know God can do that? Even he's done it in other countries. But many times we'll, we'll take a word and we'll act like it's our own thing. I think God wants to share. Uh, he's just looking for a willing vessel. I'll be honest, I'm scared. I'm afraid at times that I'm going to say the wrong thing. Huh? Amen. I mean, if you start speaking in tongues, say, Lord, what did I really say? Well, you proposed to him. Uh, God ain't going to do that. Amen? Come on. So purpose is, is a sign. The scripture says it's a sign to unbelievers. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 11. It says, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amen. They were speaking the language of, of, our, of where we're from to use with interpretation for the edification of the local church. A lot of you look these up in, in your scriptures to edify yourself, to speak directly to God. Satan himself doesn't even know what we're saying. Amen. It's going directly to God. That's the purpose. Keep rolling, bro. Amen. You know, we'll get in. Let's talk about tongues a little bit. Let's talk. Well, yeah, let's don't. Let me look around here. Can I have you shoe? Okay, this is a tongue. Everybody good with that? This is soul. Everybody good with that? Many times we only focus on the tongue. We, you know, because we just, we, we think about the Holy Spirit. And all we talk about is the tongues. And this is where we mess up. You, you, you got to believe in the whole shoe. Amen. This, what I love about the Holy Spirit is he is my advocate. He is my uh, uh, he's paracleto, he stands, he, he, he tells God, I know he's human, I know he's done stupid stuff, but you know you love that boy. And God said, I know it. And Satan says, don't give him another chance, send him to hell with me. And then and my advocate says, are you kidding? He's washing the blood of his son. And God says, yeah, he's wa and, and this, is the, this is what goes on in heaven for you. So when you think about the Holy Spirit, don't just focus on the tongue all the time. Focus on the whole shoe. Amen. Realize he's more than the tongue. And if you do that, you'll probably end up speaking in tongues quicker. Because all you've been focusing on is a language instead of the person. So invite the person into your life. Amen. Invite the presence of God into your life. Remember, he drew you. He, he's your friend. Jesus said, I'm going away that the Spirit can come. In other words, I'm never going to leave you. You're always going to be there. I'm always going to be there for you. So any, uh, any questions real quick? Amen. Can I take one more lesson? Can I go through one more lesson real quick before you take a break? Because I know some of you have got to get rid of that coffee. <laughs> Let's talk about spiritual warfare real quick. One of the things that you find out when you get born again is you're in a fight. Everybody say a fight. I mean, you are in a fight. You know, you once belonged to darkness, and now God has pulled you over into the light. Because of that, and the uh, You've you got to recognize you're in this war, 2 Corinthians 2.11. We are not ignorant of his devices. He has certain devices. And the scripture gives three of them right off the bat. I've already mentioned them. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. He's never changed. Satan has always used these three things to combat and destroy men and women. So recognize it. Realize it. 
For 5,000 years, that's all he's used. He's never had new tricks. He just had new people to use it on. So every time we come along, and then we stumble and have to deal with that. So second, refuse, which means passive warfare. Learn how to ignore the devil. I got born again, like I said, 1979. By the time we hit the 80s, the, the 80s was a, 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 had, was a very twisted level on spiritual warfare. One of the things I do as your pastor is I try to guard you. I try to look after you. I try to keep you from getting into uh, weird stuff. And there was some weird stuff that happened in the 80s. Well, what I mean by that, we had acne devils. There were people literally trying to cast out pimple devils from people. Anything that was wrong with people, uh, you know, the, the, they coughed up frogs in garbage cans and said that was a devil. You know, you could, there was eight, how many remember a book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Going to Come Back in 88? Anybody remember that book? I had that book. 88 Reasons. 1988, Jesus was supposed to come again. And the church world went crazy. They were trying, they were saving up, they were preparing. Well, I'm, so, I'm sorry, they were selling, they were getting rid of. They, were, they, were, they thought Jesus come in 88. And they, they had books out. It, it, it fanned through the body of Christ. It didn't happen. It happened, it was supposed to happen September 1988, it didn't happen. The same guy wrote another book, 89 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come in 89. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. This is how weird things were getting. And people were buying that book, but not as many as was believing that it was going to happen. I remember when I first came to Crosby, I had a, a, a man try to get me to go up in a plane with him. And, he, and I said, why are you going to go in a plane? He said, we're going to fly over the town of Crosby, and we're going to rebuke the prince and the power of the air. So we're going to get up in the air and rebuke the devil. I looked at him, and I quoted scripture. I said, Jesus said, lo, I'm with you always. So I'll stay low. You go high, I'll go low. I'll stay right down here and rebuke the devil. Amen. I ain't got to go up there. Crazy things were happening. And everything under the ideas of, of spiritual warfare. I, I had a, 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 a sister-in-law once that got so involved in spiritual things that it was called dominion theology. And I, I believe in dominion theology. I believe in mowing grass. That's taking dominion. I believe in uh, uh, taking out wild hogs. That's taking dominion. I believe in training my dog. That's taking dominion. This is proper taking dominion. But now she got into some weird stuff. And she would look at, uh, this actually happened. I lived in a trailer house at that time, and it was hot, and I had the door open. We were eating breakfast. They had pancakes. You got pancakes. You got syrup. You got syrup. You got flies. Yep. Doors open. Flies are in the house. And she started looking at them flies, and she'd just come out of this little Bible college, and she's sitting there with, with her husband, Paul, and I heard her say, in the name of Jesus, flies, get out of this house. And she stared at them flies. Now, I'm watching this. I hadn't, been, I hadn't been saved about 16 months at this time, you know, and I'm observing what's going on. And she does it again. In Jesus' name, flies, leave this house. And I'm watching them flies. I know just enough scripture. I get me a fly swatter. And I walk over and I stare at that fly. And I hit that fly and I kill it. And I looked at her and I said, faith without works is dead. In other words, you do what you can do. Then you take care of the possible. Let God take care of the impossible. Don't waste God's time on flies when you can shut the door and get a fly swatter. All right? This is what I mean by spiritual warfare. You've got to decide what it is that you really got to fight. And you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You've got an enemy. You've got an enemy that hates you. Amen. And, and he, wants to, he wants nothing but the worst for you. If Jesus came to give abundant life, Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. So you've got to be alert. You've got to be uh, you go understand it. Acts chapter 19, verse 15. I'm, I'm going to move through some things. Just, just leave that up there unless that's on the overhead somewhere. Uh, Acts 19, is that, is that on there anywhere? You see, Acts 19 is a story about a man that had a devil. And seven boys come to cast the devil out of him. The boys were, last name was Sceva. They laid hands on the man. And the man actually said this, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? In other words, I know Jesus in hell. This is what they did. They said, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, come out of him. Because they'd seen Paul casting out devils. And so at that moment, the devil rose up in the man and said, Jesus, I know him. Paul, oh yeah, I know him. And, and if I could be blunt, who in hell are you? In other words, who down here in hell are you? Because I don't know you here. 
And the Bible says that man beat them seven boys, stripped their clothes off, left them streaking, running out through Jerusalem naked, beat them up good. It doesn't say the devil ever got cast out of the guy. Amen. In other words, if you go into this wrong, if you're not prayed up, you don't love Jesus, if you don't understand the Bible, don't mess with devils. And so they run out. Did you know in Acts 19, revival breaks out after that? People saw it and revival broke out. It never said the guy got delivered. But somehow I think when, the, when, that man, when them devils got back to hell, Satan had to beat them up. Say, man, what are y'all doing? Y'all starting revival instead of stopping it. You know, it, it just took off. And people started bringing in all of their, all of their uh, the scripture uh, said all of their paraphernalia. And they burned all that. Ephesians 6, 12 says, we wrestle, we wrestle. There, there's a wrestling match going on in, in our lives when we wrestle against the devil. It's, there won't be no time out. So first off, we recognize. Second, we refuse. Third, resist the devil. The scripture said resist him and he'll flee from you if you learn how to release him, let him go. Let me also mention to you in the area of recognize. I'll go back to that one. When I say recognize, you, all of you, because of God in your life, you have a sense of red light, green light, yellow light. There are times you're going to be around certain people, hear certain teaching, and it's a green light. Man, it's solid. You know that's good. You go for it. Then there's times you, you'll get around certain people or you hear certain teaching and a yellow light. It would be like a warning. It would be pay attention to this. In other words, today, tremendous around the world is this teaching of inclusion. Our government spouses inclusion. I believe that there's certain inclusions that we need to make. We need to include one another. But when it comes to my Jesus, if you don't know Jesus, you're not making it to heaven. Jesus said that, not me. He said that, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. You've got to come through Christ. He, his blood was for our sins. What he did on the cross was for us. It's easy for me to accept that. I don't know why it's not for others. But on the flip side, maybe they're blind through the, the God of this world. But inclusion just says that no matter what, everybody's going to be saved. We all got the same God. We all going to be good. You know, Muslim, Jew, Christian, uh, atheist, we're all going, uh, Satanist, we're all going to go to heaven. I've often said we're all going to heaven. We're just not all going to get to stay. <laughs> Scripture says we're all going there to be judged. Some are going to be on the right. Some are going to be on the left. Everybody going to heaven. You can tell folks, everybody going to heaven, but not everybody going to get to stay. And by the way, quit being so scared about hell. Hell ain't nothing compared to the lake of fire. The Bible says hell will be cast into the lake of fire. Tell somebody to go to hell is one thing. Tell them to hit the lake is a totally different story. Amen. Tell them to hit the lake. That's, that's, that's really cussing them. Okay. <laughs> they won't even know it. Uh, refuse. Refuse. Refuse to be hurt. Refuse. Refuse to take revenge. Refuse. Resist. Resist the devil. Cut off the strategy. Offense. Defensive warfare. It's the defense's job to stand in front of the goal to keep the opponent out. Defend your commitment against the enemy's lies. You're not really saved. Yes, I am. Oh, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. I'm saved by faith. But what did you do yesterday? I screwed up. I asked God to forgive me. I'm saved by faith. But you fell off the wagon. I know it was moving fast, but I got back on. You follow me? you got to stay with this thing. You can't listen to his lies. you got to defend your mind, war against thoughts that don't agree with the truth. That's why we put on the helmet of salvation, 2 Corinthians 10, 3. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Let me give you a word here to defend the gospel is the word apologetic. There's a book called um, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. It's in this, I don't know, second or third printing by Josh McDowell. If you can find that book or start learning something about apologetic, we, you, you need to defend your faith. You need to believe that what Jesus did on earth all the things that he put fulfilled while he was here in just three years that he was here. All the prophecies of the Old Testament, Prince of Peace, a wonderful counselor, mighty God, all the things that he, the, the, the crucifixion, Isaiah chapter 53, Psalm chapter uh, 122, all, all the scripture that shares about Christ coming and what was going to happen, that he would be uh, betrayed by Judas, there would be a kiss on him, all these things that, that there'd be no bones broken, this, all, that he was pierced in the side, all Old Testament stuff that talks about him in the New Testament. If you, if you take all of that statistically, 
you would have to add all the quarters up to knee high in the state of Texas. Take one, paint it red. Flip it out there somewhere between Dallas and Austin and tell somebody blindfolded to pick it up. That's the odds of what Jesus did while he was here. In other words, how can you argue against this? How, how can you fight this thing, man? So you've you got to uh, defend the gospel, first in your own mind and then to help people understand it. Some folk, uh, they, just wanna, they do want to argue. But it says here that, that arguments, I'll read it to you again. The, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. There are times that I, I want a good argument. Now, not arguing just for argument's sake, but my point is this. If I prove to you that Jesus is the Christ, what are you going to do with it? You now it's up to you. I'm going to walk away. The best argument, though, is, is your life. Just live your life in front of people. If it's pride, unbelief, depression, condemnation, those things you've got to cast down. The second is your heart, your emotions, your attitudes. Deal with the wrong ones. That's the breastplate of righteousness. Guard these things. It's the warfare that's here. Your mouth, set a guard, O Lord, over my lips. Your tongue is a dipstick to your heart. If I could get hold of your tongue and pull your tongue out, I could tell you what's in your heart. In other words, all I got to do is listen to you talk, and I can tell you what's going on inside of you. Your tongue is very important. Guard your tongue. Watch your tongue. Again, these fingers work like tongues when it comes to social media. Guard your tongue. Watch what you say. Be careful what you say. All of us, I think, at one time or another who were training up kids or raising kids have said something to them we wish we never did. And what hurt me the most is when I'm talking with my kids, particularly right now with my younger one. I realized he remembers things I said. I thought I'd, you know, I didn't mean that. I just mad when I said it. But, you rem- but he remembers that. So you got to watch your tongue. You got to watch what you say around them. Amen. Now, not only defensively, but offensive warfare. Offense tries to find a way under, around, or through the opponent. You can't just play defense, pray, praying for a tie. How many know this is not going to be a tie game down here? I mean, when it's over, it's not going to be a tie. God throws up a quarter and says, okay, devil, you get half, I'll get half. It's not the way this thing is. This thing, my friend, is a win. We're going to win this. I've looked in the book, seen the end of the book. We're going to win this thing. Jesus is going to come back on a white horse, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, sword in his hand. He's going to be taking names. He's going to be dealing with with the wicked. I'm going to tell you something. We're going to win this thing. Can I get an amen? Amen. There's something about it. The Matthew 16, 18 says, I say unto you, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In other words, uh, the, the truth of the matter is, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the truth we stand on. We serve the living God. We serve the Christ. The gates of hell will not, uh, will not prevail. Ephesians 6, 12 mentions the rulers of this world. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places principalities are rulers over a specific territory. Um, you ever travel from one place to the other and realize just how quick the atmosphere changed? How quick, how dark it got? I didn't recognize that much being in Alabama. When I came to Houston, I really picked up on it because of the population. I worked in a little town called Channel View, Texas for a period of time, and I would travel up Woodforce Boulevard, and I would hit North Shore. And North Shore was a more upscale. The people were a little more upscale. But then I could shift over to a little bit. Many of you know about this area, Cloverleaf. And I dealt with a lot of kids in Cloverleaf. But I, I found out that a lot of them were dealing with drugs and alcohol, their family, and it just kept rotating back. And it just seemed like they, they were caught in a cycle. And these are principalities. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But we do fight against principalities. So when I, I go to certain areas, I've preached in Africa. I've seen great revival in one area and the other side just be as dark and voodoo as it could be, just full of wickedness. I go to New Orleans. I go to the West Bank. Man, it's like things are happening for God. I go to Bourbon Street. You can feel the chill. You can just feel that the people don't want what's right. They like what's wrong. They like the darkness. Been to Vegas I've, I've been to places in Vegas where, where, where were very good and hidden other places that were very dark. In other words, there's principalities. So when you're praying, you've got to pray against those principalities, the rulers over a specific territory. Satan, he, he has 
rulers. He has people that he sends to certain areas to take care of certain things. You know what's bad in this area? Murder. I've never seen so many people die as they do around here. Last night, la yeah, la young people, but last night there were several killed in the Houston area. Uh, it's a spirit. So when you're praying for Houston, rebuke the spirit of murder, of death and hatred of others, uh, the, the lack of love for humanity when you do that. It, you know, uh, the powers of strongholds, that's another thing we deal with. The more we sin, the greater the enemy's grip in our life. You know, I mentioned alcohol to you all ago. If I, if I fall back into that, then, then it's going to grip my life, and I know it. So I have to watch out and say, okay, I can't let that hold on to me. Forces of darkness. Satan's main tactic is keeping people's mind in darkness through, the, through lies and deceit. What about occults? Or cults, period. Atheism. Believe there is no God. Uh, I think it takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a, a, a Christian. How are you going to sit around and believe there's not a God and try to convince me there's not a God? Are you, this is, this is, but they do. So it takes a lot of faith to be an atheist. And you know what atheists mostly are? They're people that have copped out. They're people that just kind of, uh, they, they don't want, it's their excuse to try to keep from serving God or living for God. Uh, strange teachings, doctrines. Um, Scientology. I don't know much about it, but yeah, it's some crazy stuff. Let me tell you, I, here in this little town of Crosby, when I first started pastoring, I had this sweet little old couple. Jay, I don't know if you remember them. I'm trying to remember their names now. Sweet little couple. And they, they came to church here, and, and they found out that I had a, another brother-in-law in Carolina who believed in what is called a never-die doctrine, that if we, according to the Old Testament, if we've been redeemed from the curse of the law, which is in the Old Testament, the curse of the law would be childbirth pains, that a woman should never feel another childbirth pain. That's funny. I mean, all you got to do is take your upper lip and stretch it over your head and realize it's going to hurt. Okay. But childbirth pain, what's the other? Sweat. Uh, sweat of your brow. Uh, death. So I met this couple, and they loved, they loved my teaching and preaching because they found out that I was connected with my brother-in-law who believed that we could live forever, that we would get so close to God that these bodies, watch this, and they got Bible for it. The earth is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. The earth is groaning, right? Sister Diane, it says that. The earth is, is, is it's like it's going through convulsions or having a baby. The earth is. So they use this thought that we're going to manifest. In other words, it's just like walking, and then the next thing you know, I have manifested or I have come glorified on earth. So I have this body that I'll never die. And so I had this older couple in my church who believed that because they didn't want to die. And so they held on to that belief. The problem is they were still aging. You know, if I'm never going to die, I still don't want to look 105. <laughs> right? With all the ailments that go with that. So they, and when, when I told them, guys, I don't believe what my brother-in-law believes. I believe that we are going to taste death. It's going to happen. They quit the church because I was a heretic to them, and I was full of unbelief. And they were right here in this town of Crosby. And as far as I know, both have died. Because with well, that kind of teaching of spouses, uh, it makes us, uh, uh, again, and I, I got on my brother-in-law about it. You act like you're a super saint. That somehow you're going to hit this place and you're going to be all that. Why do you want to believe that? When the Bible teaches that these tents wear out. They wear out. This is, this is life. Amen. And if I learned to embrace that, if I had learned this earlier, maybe I could have took a little better care of this tent. Amen. Where am I at here? Take authority in Jesus' name. Uh, disarm in the devil. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphant over them by the cross. He disarmed the powers. I've often used this, guys, that Jesus has disarmed and defeated the devil. To disarm means to remove his arms. To defeat means to remove his feet. So if Jesus defeated the devil and disarmed the devil... What are you looking at? A talking torso. That's it. A worm moving through. Another one, I'm telling you, the devil is, is uh, an old friend of mine say he's a cockroach. Amen. He, he not as, you shouldn't be as scared of him as you think you are. He ain't got no arms. He ain't got no legs, but he does have a mouth. He's always accusing you before the Father. 
That's why it's important that you have the Holy Spirit standing up for you. Luke chapter 10, verse 17, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. The scripture says the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And Jesus replied, and he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've been given the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book. Let me give you that scripture again. That's Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20. Luke 10, 17 through 20. Luke 10, 17 through, 10, through 20. Rejoice not because you're able to cast out devils. Jesus always bringing balance. But rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. That's your reason to rejoice. You know, they were trying to cast out. The, they, they were casting out devils. They were feeling good about themselves. Jesus said, don't, 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 don't get all into that, man. Let me tell you something. If your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, that's what you ought to be excited about. And by the way, he said, I saw Satan fall. I saw Satan fall. This is another thought. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word was with God. In the beginning was the Word. So if you were to ask me, when did Jesus show up? He's always been. he been the Word. Amen. He is the Word. God spoke the Word, and the earth was. He's always began with the Father. It's a glorious mix-up. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you saw Dad. You ever seen a kid and say, I know who your daddy is? Uh, you could tell by being around, I know who your daddy is. I can tell by where you walk, where you talk, where you, everything you do. I know who your daddy is. That's the same way. That's the same way that if you saw Jesus, you knew the Father. It's a glorious mix-up. I'm convinced when we get to heaven, we see one throne, one God. I don't see three, three hello, Father, hello, Son, hello, Holy Ghost. I don't think we're going to see three. It's you are body, soul, spirit. I think we'll see one. So Jesus said, I was there when I saw Satan fall. I was there when Satan was cast out of heaven, like lightning falling to the ground. I was there. When he said that to them disciples, they had to perk up a little bit and go, what? What you saying? He, man, he's just listening to what he says. Any questions about spiritual warfare? You understand you're in a fight? Need to be praying? Need to stay alert? Any other questions? Let's take a little break, Dennis. Hey, Amen. Let y'all stretch a little bit. We'll start back in about 10, 15 minutes. If you have a private question, you come up here now.